Good evening, everyone. Thank you for tuning in for session 10 of the Metro Budget 101 series. Tonight, we're having a community conversation with the experts. Uh, the purpose of tonight's conversation is to uh, bring together different perspectives on the budget and what our priority should be as a city going into the fiscal year 22 budget. We have several uh panelists with us this evening. We have Councilman Freddie O'Connell, uh, Kristen Wilson, who's the Chief Operations Officer in the Mayor's Office, uh, Director Kevin Crumbo, who's our Finance Director, Chief William Swan of the Nashville Fire Department, Jason Freeman with SEIU, Mark Young with the, um, oh gosh, my mind went, went, went blank. I'm so sorry, Mark, with the Firefighters Union. Uh, Lindsay Gilmore, who's a District 29 resident. Steve Kashopo, who is a District 23 resident, as well as Jerome Moore, who is with NOAA. And what we're going to do is we'll have a couple of rounds of questions. The first round, uh, the panelists have all been given a question to answer, and they will have two to three minutes to answer their question. And then on the second round, the community members of the panel, uh, which would be uh, Mr. Moore, Mr. Kashopo, Ms. Gilmore, Mr. Young, and Mr. Freeman have prepared questions in advance for our experts. Uh, and they will take turns asking their questions that they submitted beforehand. And the person on the, the expert that that question is uh, directed to will have the opportunity to answer and they will have two minutes to answer. And any of the experts who like to chime in on a question and respond uh, is welcome to do so. So we will get started uh, with our round one. So our first question is for Councilman Freddie O'Connell. Looking at the recent uh, capital spending plan, it looks like the administration is taking it more in neighborhoods other than downtown focus. As the council member representing downtown, what's your take on this? Is this the correct approach? Council member, what are the key issues for you going into budget season? I know that was several reference to one. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. So these are these are two good and important questions. And I think it's it's actually a great opportunity to draw the lines between the capital process and the operating process, right? So every year, Metro between the mayor's office, council, obviously the Metro Finance Department. Uh, is required to pass an operating budget. Um, that basically gives us the operating dollars to fund metro government, fund public services year over year. That does uh, part of that uh, is also paying down um, debt that has accumulated. Right, we keep an eye on debt as a share of that operating budget. Then separately, every year we also pass a capital improvements budget. Now, at any time, a given mayor's office uh, and finance uh, can come to the table with a capital spending plan that does not have to occur on a fixed schedule. Um, you know, in the wake of the Nashville flood and great recession, there was a year that went by that did not have one. The previous capital spending plan we saw this term was relatively small. So on the table right now that council is considering uh, is a capital spending plan, which allocates to those things that require capital. Those might be heavy equipment for uh, first responders. Those might be schools, right? So the first part of this question is about the capital spending plan that's on the table in front of us. And I guess I would maybe dispute it. So a couple important points here. This is the third largest uh, capital spending plan, I believe in Metro history, coming on the heels of a pretty tough year and a smaller capital spending plan that preceded it. Um, it also makes an extraordinary investment in public education. And while it might seem less downtown focused than previous capital spending plans, I think one of the important things for Metro to do is be able to pace growth in various parts of the city. We know, for instance, Southeast Nashville is growing rapidly. We know that other parts of the city, um, some of them being urban, but including in East Nashville, kind of south of downtown in Wedgwood, Houston, and kind of as you get out to the fairgrounds, uh, we've seen a lot of growth. We've seen a lot of growth out toward Midtown along the Buchanan Street corridor out to D.B. Todd. And it's important to be able to, to take the success of our uh, urbanizing city and be able to make those investments countywide. There are some critically important investments in here that are focused on downtown. There is a finally finishing up some of the lower Broadway pedestrian improvements as Broadway has in, increased its success 
Um, there, frankly, is not enough room for people to move around on the sidewalks down there. We had that project designed several years ago and could not fund it. That is in there. Um, we have some important uh, transit investments. There is basically a downtown study that is funded here, uh, along with um, some traffic and sort of traffic management investments that are going to benefit downtown. Uh, Fire Station Two uh, basically was decommissioned a couple of years ago. We had a, a, a few different conversations about what to do about a facility that was in such a state of disrepair as to basically be in a condemned state. And finally, in this budget, there is uh, money allocated to rebuild Fire Station 2. That's a big deal. Um, and while not strictly downtown, there are some important urban neighborhood investments. There is basically an Edge Hill and North Nashville uh, planning piece in there. And then there is also some North Nashville infrastructure. And, and again, I represent part of 37208, which is historically a North Nashville zip code, but it does come right into the area inside the interstate loop. And so infrastructure investments that improve anything in 37208 might not be strictly downtown. Same thing for another piece of this that I was very excited to see is a funding initiative that could lead to a major repair for one of Nashville's worst scars uh, which is where I-40 tore th through Jefferson Street uh, and divided a community along our historically African-American corridor of culture. Um, this capital spending plan includes millions of dollars to begin to create a cap there that would offer connectivity and really be restorative for that corridor. Now, there are plenty of other investments. There's $100 million in there for, for a, a new high school in Bellevue. Um, there are new school capacities in Cane Ridge, uh, one a new school and one in addition to a school. We know that Southeast is growing quickly, and so new school capacity down there is a, is a big piece of it. I mean, I, I think from my vantage point, there is a lot in this budget that is worth uh, serious consideration for all of my colleagues across the, the county. And I, I saw plenty of in there uh, that was appropriate for downtown without being inappropriately balanced, tilted just in favor of downtown. So that's that piece. For the operating piece for fiscal year 22, um, we're looking obviously at a couple of things. We've got a lot of challenges um, where we have a, you know, we are still existing in a an economy that is weighed down by COVID. It's a combined public health and economic crisis uh, that has impacted a lot of people. I know I've heard from uh, my constituents, some of whom have gotten evicted, some of whom have needed uh, rent or mortgage assistance, some of whom have needed food assistance, some of whom have needed utility assistance. I mean, we, we've dug deep to try to provide um, as much as we can for vulnerable Nashvillians. We had a, a challenging fiscal cycle last year that resulted in a significant property tax increase. That's going to be followed up this year uh, with an assessment cycle, right? And so we're going to have to look at things in those terms. In terms of priorities, I want to make sure we're building on what we did last year, where our the, the budget that the Metro Council approved uh, moved several important employees on the Metro school side up to $15 an hour wage floor. I think that's a really big deal. Uh, I'm looking at the teacher pay study that Mayor Cooper commissioned. I'm hoping that this mayor's office and the council combined uh, can really start to make investments in our teachers, uh, especially after a really challenging year on public health in the public school system. Um, I think, uh, you know, otherwise I'm looking for the similar sort of balanced priorities approach that I see in the capital spending plan that's on the table in front of us. So that's, that's and, and you know, ultimately, I want us to make bigger investments in transit uh, and fulfill kind of where we have tried to move active transportation, especially with COVID still being around for most of this year, we can make really important investments in the way people move around the city uh, without needing to be in vehicles, um, you know, being uh, finding active transportation options is a big deal, and I'd like to see some more of that in the budget as well. Thank you so very much, uh, Councilmember O'Connell. That was a very um, robust and informative answer. So thank you. We appreciate that. Uh, the next question goes to Kristen Wilson uh, with the Mayor's Office. What are the administration's priorities for the FY 2022 budget? Sure, thank you very much. Can you hear me all right? We can, yes, loud right. and clear. Great. Um, I appreciate very much uh, Councilmember O'Connell's uh, description of 
the operating budget versus the capital spending budget. And so I'm going to focus my comments right now on the operating budget, um, which is the FY22 budget that'll be um, before us in the coming weeks. Uh, the administration right now is just gathering input this week from departments on the budget. And um, we will be uh, working uh, through some initial input and then doing some meetings internally to understand that. Uh, and uh, also working to understand where revenue is coming in. Uh, and again, as, as, as Councilmember O'Connell indicated, uh, this is an assessment year, a reappraisal year. Uh, uh, it'll be very important for us to understand where, where that lands and where our opportunities are um, uh, economically as we recover still from COVID-19. So all those parts and pieces are just um, coming together now, and we're very early in the in the process. Uh, our obligation is by May 1st, before May 1st, to deliver to council a budget proposal from the mayor's office. Um, as we go into this, FY20, as we know, and FY21 has had some unprecedented challenges that have really stressed our resources. It's required all of us to sustain our essential services delivery, but under some expanded fiscal constraints, um, both uh, uh, spending reductions that we made in the creation of the FY21 budget, as well as uh, additional spending restraints we put in over the course of the year to conserve cash in particular, um, hiring freezes, uh, operating spending reductions, and the non-essential capital spending freeze that's, that's been underway. Um, we've also had safety constraints. And so we've been asking our department leaders, our uh, elected officials, and our employees to really uh, both change their operating model at the same time for safety reasons, at the same time they've had less resources uh, to work with. And um, and so I've just got to say after, you know, a year plus of emergencies, disasters, pandemic, um, uh, I know Chief Swan on the, is on the line. He and I have been tied at the hip this week uh, uh, as we've gone through the winter weather emergencies. Um, so we may be on our sixth um, state of emergency in 12 months. Our focus is on um, now recovery and rebuilding and in an equitable manner with a focus on all of Nashville. So we've published a set of priorities initially um, for the budget as we go into this process. Um, the highest priority for us is still to ensure our emergency response, emergency responses uh, in particular to the pandemic. Uh, that's, that's always gotta be our most important mission as a government is to protect the life, health and safety of our residents and visitors. And so, um, while we are grateful and we're hopeful to see what comes through from the upcoming federal stimulus and that process, um, as we have that as an input coming in, we've still got to make sure we're uh, accommodating and thinking through how we support our public health approaches to COVID-19, uh, to related uh, concerns in disease management, um, behavioral health impacts of the pandemic, health equity and access, and um, the, the, the last federal stimulus we had really um, didn't fully cover all the costs and needs we had out of that. We actually had to shift around a fair amount within the government to make sure we were ensuring response. I'm uh, hopeful about the upcoming one, but um, we'll be taking that in as an input to determine, and that's gonna be our highest priority. You know, the other things we're looking to uh, do are invest in key recovery priorities, education, uh, very much uh, a shared priority. Uh, thank you for your comments earlier, Council Member O'Connell. The Mayor Hat Cooper came into office with an emphasis on education and with neighborhood investments. And we're hoping we'll be able to strengthen Nashville's public schools by addressing some of the needs that have been highlighted and challenged by our emergencies, um, in particular supporting our teachers, ensuring all our students from every neighborhood have access to some quality educational experiences. Uh, public safety and justice, is another area um, uh, uh, kind of a, a common place to um, a lot of cities uh, across the country. We have seen an increase in uh, in violence, in particular in homicides, a very concerning one. And so uh, investments to ensure community safety. We wanna reduce crime. We wanna make sure we're quickly responding to emergencies. I'm sure Chief Swan will have uh, further perspective on that uh, too. Uh, we wanna enhance our violence prevention efforts, further community engagement capabilities, meet the needs of our first responders, emergency managers, and support an equitable and fair criminal justice system. Uh, and then economic opportunity is another really important aspect of recovery. 
Uh, and um, we want to make sure we're looking at targeted and effective support for our youth, for our vulnerable citizens, our essential workers, and small businesses. Um, we need to make sure they're all participating in the recovery and, and future growth of Nashville. Um, underpinning all of this is, is making sure that we are continuing to strengthen the government from a financial perspective, uh, uh, continue to ensure our ability to meet our fund balance policy minimums, obligations that we have, uh, uh, as, and, and making sure that we're uh, in a path so that, again, as some of these concerns come our way, disasters or challenges, that we're, we're able to, to weather them and, 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 and support our people and, and maintain our primary mission. Um, the last thing I'll add is, is that we are hoping we'll still have capacity as we do this to look at getting back to our uh, neighborhood infrastructure priorities that we uh, were hopeful to look at last year as well. Um, and uh, just were challenged from a financial perspective from doing so. Transportation, um, looking at establishing a Metro Department of Transportation to bring some greater focus and accountability to how we connect our residents, um, businesses, schools, neighborhoods, includes not just um, not just roads and cars, but transit, walking and biking, rights of way, curbside management. There are already initiatives that are starting to roll out, but uh, we we really have opportunity to increase our execution capability around those and invest uh, further. Sustainability uh, is a is an important priority from our neighborhood infrastructure perspective. Thinking about our preservation of our natural resources, uh, waste waste services, stormwater, green energy. Um, we had a very robust discussion last year about affordable housing. There's a committee in place right now in the mayor's office working on recommendations. Uh, and uh, we are looking forward to figuring out the most effective ways to support the building funding and preserving of housing op options uh, uh, for all here in Nashville. And then uh, finally, uh, overall neighborhoods, we just got to get back to basics and get them right for fostering livable communities, green space, recreation, libraries, public health services. There's a there's a lot of um, uh, needs that we're gonna be sorting through, but uh, that should give you at least the, the overview of, of the priorities with which we're approaching the budget. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Uh, the next question is for uh, Kevin Crumbo, our finance director, and, and it is also a, a series of questions. Uh, what were the projected losses for fiscal year 21? What is the actual loss year to date? And what does the finance department project will be the total actual losses for the fiscal year? Do you anticipate having as conservative of an outlook for fiscal year 2022 in regard to revenues? Director Crumbo, can you unmute yourself? Uh-oh. Looks like he's good now. There we go. We got you. Yeah, I had to do multiple sign-ons to get on. I'm hoping they're all the right combo. Well, one of the questions you didn't ask me is how much coffee do I need every day to keep up with that list that Kristen just <laughs> went through? And the answer is I start with a double espresso right out of bed every morning. So uh, anyway, it's been a, a real pleasure working with her through this budget cycle um, already. We're just getting started on that. And um, with respect to your questions here, uh, this first one about projected losses for fiscal year 21, uh, we really won't have a loss in uh, 2021. And the reason I say that is that, um, you know, we're required as a government to have a balanced budget each and every year. And ours is about $2.5 billion in revenue matched up with about the same in uh, expenses. And so we do our best to stay within that budget each and every year. Uh, when I hear people talk about losses that we may be uh, expecting, um, I think that that gets confused with the topic of revenues, uh, particularly during this COVID period where, uh, as uh, Freddie was saying at the beginning, we're in a pandemic you know, economy. And that means a lot of things to a lot of people. But what it meant to us at the outset uh, of the pandemic is we thought economic activity would come down. And first would hurt us with respect to our activities taxes, sales taxes, beer taxes, and that sort of thing. And um, that did happen. Um, it wasn't quite as bad uh, as we thought it would be up front. Uh, and that's true for us, the state, and you know so many others around the country, uh, but neither has been the recovery. 
And so, um, you know, we'll learn a lot from this uh, experience. I'm sure that we talked about economists uh, for a lot of years, but when I hear losses, I, I think folks tend to, to look at it in the regard. But with respect to our bottom line, as the saying goes, I, I don't expect that to happen. Uh, in fact, what I do expect is that uh, by the end of this fiscal year, uh, we will be um, at or maybe a little bit above uh, the fund balance minimums that Kristen mentioned. And uh, fund balance minimums are a uh, concept of uh, accrual accounting, really. And what ours says is we want to have uh, fund balances that are at or above uh, 5% of our expenses uh, in any given year. So on 2.5 billion, uh, you can all do the math there. Um, I look more closely than fund balance really at our cash balances. And uh, we have accumulated uh, quite a lot of those uh, through the course of this year. But when I say quite a lot, it's a relative term. Uh, we were really starting to run out of cash at the last fiscal year. Now we've accumulated some balances that are pretty close to our fund balance minimums. Uh, so cash and fund balance come close together and it gives us some stability here as a as a government. Uh, and that should be a very pleasing thing to all of our constituents to know that, uh, yes, their government can meet payroll. Uh, yes, their government can live up to its debt obligations, its capital spending, some of the things that were you know, mentioned uh, already here. Uh, so I'm very pleased about that. Um, we won't know until the end of the year exactly where we land, but I think it will be in stable territory. It's uh, I think very safe to say that. Uh, with respect to um, the revenue forecasting for the next fiscal year, uh, important to understand that we as a metro government really have three primary sources of revenue. Uh, we have property taxes, which is our largest source. Uh, we have activities taxes, which again are sales taxes and things really depend on some sort of economic activity. And then we have all different types of fees and so forth that go into a, a third bucket there. Uh, the question that I get asked the most uh, as we come into this year, which is a property reappraisal year, is um, boy, what do you think that projection is going to look like? And the answer to that is it's just a little too soon to tell. Um, another month or two, we'll have a better uh, understanding as to what that may look like. Uh, but that depends in large part on what the property value of the county really turns out to be. And that's the domain of our um, elected uh, property assessor, uh, Vimin Wilho. Who I don't see on the call today. I, uh, and I don't want to speak for her, but uh, she's indicated to me that she expects that the general value of the county is, has gone up, even in the midst of the pandemic. And I don't know that that's going to be true for every uh, corner of the county. It may be rather unevenly spread for a variety of reasons, but generally she expects that to go up. And as many of you know, uh, when that happens, uh, we have an equalization uh, set of rules that says we'll adjust the tax rate so that we don't have, you know, a big additional tax um, on our constituents all at one time. And again, that could come out very unevenly. Uh, so both of those are subject to a lot of things to come, subject to a lot of math. And I'll be speaking about that as we get a little bit, you know, closer uh, to the time. Uh, with respect to sales taxes and so forth, uh, we're going to continue uh, doing the best we can to project what we think consumers are going to spend and what our taxes on that may be. Uh, that in large part right now is going to depend, I think, on a federal stimulus package. Uh, the last one was quite effective and probably, you know, helped us exceed, you know, the worst fears that we had last spring and on into the summer. Uh, we're starting to see that level out now. And so another stimulus to ride out the rest of the economy probably will help that. Um, if we don't see that stimulus, then I think we'll be on the downside of, of forecasting. Uh, but my job, of course, is to make sure that whatever the number is we forecast, uh, that it's as realistic uh, as it can be. Um, I don't really look at it as being conservative or liberal um, in the sense that corporations do, but rather um, projecting something that I know we can match up the expenses and leave us in a really stable place as a, as a government. Um, so I'll stop there uh, and simply leave you the thought that I do believe our government's reached a very stable uh, spot uh, in this current administration. Uh, a lot more I'll be talking about uh, during the budget, and it's my greatest hope and really push right now is to push us to sustainability. And that would touch on a great number of the topics that Kristen uh, was describing. Uh, so more to follow on that, and thanks for having me here tonight. Thank you so very much, Director Crumball. Our next 
question <laughs> is for Chief Swan. Chief, how has COVID impacted the uh, National Fire Department's budget and what budget challenges do you anticipate for uh, FY22? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to come on here, but uh, as Kristen has sort of alluded to earlier, I'm usually uh, I can be a little bit more prepared, but uh, we've just been dealing with challenges uh, all this week. And um, it's been, uh, again, challenges that we've been meeting and I couldn't be more proud to be, of course, you know, Director Chief of the uh, the Fire Department, but also with the Office of Emergency Management. Um, so, but when the, the questions that you asked was directed towards COVID-19, how has it impacted uh, my department? Um, I think my problems are probably the same problems that uh, that most departments or anyone would be facing at this time, especially in the uh, public safety emergency field. Uh, so we have an increase in overtime due to the COVID leave, you know, with employees being sick or uh, caring for uh, sick family members or being quarantined uh, from exposure. Uh, we're very fortunate that we actually had our own um, systems, which we did our own testing, which made everything work more efficient and fluently when we got some exposure or people uh, that uh, that actually came down with COVID, we were able to uh, move quickly and start a process that actually was uh, adopted throughout uh, Metro. We uh, assisted with other departments just because we are in a medical field. I mean, the fire department is made up of, of just about, you know, fire, EMS, and fire marshal office and so many other facets that we deal with. But then we had an increase uh, uh, also, uh, increased cost of medical uh, and safety supplies, uh, shortage of medical supplies uh, necessitates advanced purchases to uh, maintain inventory levels. And then the other thing was uh, in, indirectly a uh, fire marshal uh, permit revenue decreased due to council uh, events. So I think along with all of that, you hear the overtime, which will be the biggest facet uh, it's just fatigue, wear and tear on our departments. Uh, you can imagine um, all of and the men and women that work for the fire department and in office emergency management, just like all the departments. I will speak on mine, but I know that when I say this, when it comes to public safety, uh, this this formula that or the statement I'm about to make will fit with all of those. I mean, it's just been a complete honor uh, to be um, in this time to be able to serve uh, the citizens that were sworn to. And it's been challenging, but we've um, they've met every one of those challenges and we'll continue to uh, do what we need to do to, um, again, to combat uh, COVID-19. And, and we're so proud and glad that when vaccinations come out in our department, we ended up being about 65% vaccinated, which was really great. And that number's increasing as well. Uh, like most people, uh, uh, some people were, were a little apprehensive about taking the vaccination. Uh, as more took it, it opened up the, the opportunity for others to do so. So I'm hoping um, uh, as far as the um, being off sick and, and taking care of and being quarantined, that will come down. So our challenges in short uh, have been with overtime and, of course, with medical supply and safety supply and shortages. But um, also, we searched for a lot of grants during this period where there was a small match and the administration did allow us to do that, which was really great. So uh, another thing we did was prepped uh, in preparation of this COVID-19 coming down. Uh, we seen it coming shortly uh, before March. We started looking at the possibility uh, if this becomes a pandemic and it affects us like it's you know, affecting others, how would we be able to manage it? So we started pre, uh, you know, masks, gloves, uh, gowns, uh, shields, and somewhat some of that's part of our DNA anyway. Because uh, you know we have to make sure precautionary measures that we take care of um, our patients. We make sure we take care of ourselves. So we PPE, personal uh, protective equipment. We have uh, we just upped it up a little bit when we start wearing masks all the time. Start wearing. Uh, more the shields and, and so again um, in short that's uh, I, I know I hope it's not sounding like I'm rambling but um, that's how it has affected, uh, affected us from financially to the mental aspect of it but 
Um, but we're doing fine and we'll keep, we will keep moving. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chief Swan. Our next question is for Jason Freeman. What should the city's priorities be in fiscal year 22? Well, uh, thank you for the question. Um, again, Jason Freeman, I'm with SEIU Local 205. And we represent um, a lot of Metro government employees, as well as folks at General Hospital and support staff in Metro schools. Um, and I think uh, the first priority, uh, we've heard a couple of people mention the reappraisal or the reassessment. And to me, the, the biggest priority has to be ensuring that we do not make the same mistake that was made in 2017 and in 2010. Um, a lot of the reasons that we were forced to have a 34% uh, property tax adjustment this year is because we made this mistake of taking the revenue neutral tax rate. And I know it's very confusing for people uh, to understand how we got in this situation. And, and that's really the answer is that we've, we've kind of forgotten how to navigate the reappraisal process in the past. And I think it has to be uh, top of mind that that doesn't happen again. Um, and you know, to really put a pin on that, you know, we've seen this capital spending plan and it's wonderful to see a large capital spending plan that that prioritizes public schools. Um, but for context, $191 million is less than half of what the actual year one request is from Metro schools for capital spending. What they actually need is $420 million. Uh, and the 10 year number is $4.5 billion. And I think, I think that folks really need to understand that the city has grown so rapidly uh, and we have not been able to make the investments uh, to keep up with that growth. And that's why it's so imperative that we keep the revenues uh, stable. Um, aside from that, I would say the priorities really need to be core services uh, across the board. Chief Swan, who by the way, I miss seeing you at the gym, Chief, but you've uh, talked a lot about uh, the public safety needs, but also the core services Libraries and community centers are places that have been understaffed. You know, we've had um, partial or full hiring freezes for many, many years out of the past decade or you know, 15 years. Um, infrastructure investment uh, around the county, we hear all the time that people, you know, they're okay with paying uh, and, you know, and providing the revenues the city needs, but they want to see those uh, investments in their neighborhood in infrastructure. Um, Couple of things that have really come to light during the pandemic. I think we have to continue to prioritize Nashville General Hospital. I think it can't, you know, uh, it's it's so important as we see in this global pandemic how important it is to have a public hospital in the city uh, and to make it a priority. Um, we've also seen that um, paid leave uh, is a huge issue. And you know, one thing I like to remind people is Metro is the third largest employer in Davidson County. And when we hear announcements that you know companies are moving to Nashville to create a bunch of high paying jobs, people get you know excited about that. And we should we should think of Metro in the same way. Uh, we should want Metro to be a model employer to have competitive wages because that lifts up the boat for everyone. It creates pressure in the labor market to give people in every job better bargaining position. And we should encourage Metro to be a model employer. And right now in Metro public schools, there is no paid family leave. Um, and so during this pandemic, if, if people got sick, you know, if they there was the federal government extending the Family First Cares Act, but once that expired, there were again back to no paid family leave in Metro schools. Um, and that's an area that I think could be addressed. Um, and, uh, I think that's I think that's good. I think leave some time for other folks. Thank you so much, uh, Jason. I appreciate you. Um, Acknowledge and trying to stay with time. I know everyone is so so rich and such robust information. I know it's hard to to get it all in in that two to three minutes. So thank you for trying. Um, our next question goes to Mark Young with the Firefighters uh, Union. What are the most pressing needs for the city's first responders, and what should the city's priorities be for the FY twenty two budget? Well, thank you, Delisha and uh, Council Lady Toombs for having us. So what uh, what I would say and what I've probably been saying for the last 10 years is um, the fire department has not grown uh, at all. It's actually, uh, if you look at uh, this as a perspective of what uh, run volumes, population, 
uh, the growth of the city, the fire department has actually decreased. I would say 20 years ago, we was a, we was a um, average fire department that uh, I felt like I could say we were one of the larger fire departments in the state. Uh, but if you compare this now, we are actually one of the smallest fire departments in the state. Uh, the city, the the city, just the city of Memphis alone has 59 fire stations, and they man each piece of equipment with four men. Nashville, now now Shelby County, we'll compare Shelby County to Davidson County. Shelby County has 90 fire stations in the county. We have 39. We have not added a fire station to the services of the residents of Davidson County in 20 years. Look at the growth of this city in the last 20 years. So what I think priorities ought to be, I know we're not gonna fix this in one budget cycle, but we have got to start thinking about what all the county surrounding Davidson County think about is as the county grows, they grow their emergency services. Look at Franklin or uh, Williamson County, Wilson County. As the population builds in these counties, they add emergency services. And Davidson County does not do that. I was hoping that when we sat down with Mayor Cooper, and when we made this endorsement, <clears throat> that we had these discussions. And uh, we went into these discussions with every council uh, person that we endorsed also. And everybody seemed to be feeling the same way, but we're not seeing any movement. And I know things are tight, COVID and all of that, but we just got the property tax increase that everybody was wanting and actually got a few more cents than uh, what uh, Mayor Cooper wanted. So I would hope that the administration is thinking about this and uh, going forward that uh, we see some increases in the emergency services. Thank you. Thank you so very much uh, for, for sharing that. And that was really eye-opening to hear that comparison to um, another city. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, the next question goes to Lindsay Gilmore. I'm very proud to be her council woman. She's a resident of District 29. Uh, Lindsay, can you share with us what you believe the city's priorities should be in the fiscal year 2020, uh, 22, excuse me? Hi, can you hear me? We can, yes, ma'am. Great. So, so sorry. Do you, is this where I need to talk about the? You can just share with us. Um, what do you think? What would you like the city to focus on for this budget? Uh, for this budget cycle. So, as a taxpayer, um, a member of the community, what do you think the city needs to prioritize when it comes to the budget? I would be excited for sidewalks, very much so. Um, I participated in um, the special committee um, from the vice mayor that he asked, you know, to form from November of 2019. And um, I am curious to see the outcomes of that and understanding due to the pandemic and um, COVID-19 and maybe construction may not be going as smoothly or even progressing as much as it would have in years past, but I'm just very anxious about um, the pedestrian deaths um, in Davidson County, more specifically Nashville, and um, when there will be a much more um, laser focus on completing sidewalk projects. Okay, thank you so very much for sharing that. I'm gonna kick that over to Council Member Toombs. Thank you, Council Member Porterfield. The next question is for Steve Kashopo. <clears throat> what do you think the city's priority should be for fiscal year 22 budget? Uh, hello, thank you for allowing me the input. I appreciate it. Um, can you all hear me okay? Nope. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, when I thought about this question you gave to me, um, I want to put a little twist on it. Um, what I would like to see is Metro or the city get their financial house in order. And what I mean by that is you can see what the mood is out here from the public. 
it's not a surprise to you. You know, there's a lot of distrust, uh, but, uh, petitions going around, trying to change everything you do and recall all of you. And that's not a healthy way to go. And when I moved here a few years ago, my background, you know, my career had been, been in government and knowing how it operates. I think I speak for a lot of people here where you see a city that's growing tremendously, getting, as I look at past budgets, about you know $100 million plus of new revenue every year for almost a decade. And yet when I move here, I see that every year there's budget deficits and and um, people you know, having to sell off property to balance the budget. And just from my review of the budget, I look at a lot of spending blamed on previous administrations and previous councils and a lot of debt. And so when it comes to budget priorities, what I would like to see is that the long-term health of local government being trusted, being able to have us look at everything you do with a, a sense of trust and confidence that the money is being spent well, and this 34%, 34 to 37% tax increase recently and a couple other things that have happened, it makes a lot of us feel like when Metro needs money, they just look to the taxpayers for money that, um, you know, equivalent to an ATM, whereas we don't see anything that Metro is doing in-house that gives us a belief that there's... Um, an efficient and effective government that's using our taxpayers wisely and and therefore hopefully future budgets we can be in a situation where every priority could be met maybe not as much as they want but right now it seems like there's not enough money or any money for any priority uh, but thank you thank you uh the next uh person is mr jerome moore and it says same Similar question, what priorities would Noah like to see the city focus on for the fiscal year 22 budget? Oh yeah, thank you. Um, and as an organizer, um, it's always about money, about organize people and organize money. And we always feel like there needs to be more money in, this, in the things here, especially specifically in Nashville. And so I'm gonna try to compartmentalize this in two to three minutes um, <laughs> on what we feel, you know, um, the city should really focus on in our areas that we focus on as an organization. Um, and and how, we, how I kind of looked at this question is, you know, what kind of community do we want Nashville to be? And what must we do to, to be that kind of community we say we want to be, right? And I think uh, with the pandemic, it has highlighted a lot of different things that have like already been going on, but you know, a lot of uh, inequities that have just been brought to the, uh, to the forefront even more, um, and more specifically in our education system. Um, it's kind of like two pillars in our education system that we really, really want to focus on. One, we really want to get to that uh, one to 250 uh, ratio for every student uh, that needs to be a, a counselor, specifically a social and emotionally learning counselor in our schools. Um, that's We feel like that will help our schools better than, uh, let's say, um, school resource officers. Um, and not saying that we want to take money from the police or anything should be defunded. I think um, they just need to be, you know, permanent uh, monies and a permanent commitment to prioritize social and emotional learning and let the police do what they do best, um, which is, um, you know, not patrolling in the schools. There's no there's no data, there's no science that's saying having SROs uh, is making schools safer or making the kids experience better. So um, we would like, you know, the, the, the mayor and metro to prioritize social and emotional learning and education and uh again it, it takes money and funds but you know that that should definitely be a, a permanent thing we would like to see in the budget um going into you know speaking of pandemic and speaking of the weather that's outside you know uh housing you know uh affordable and abundant housing is a must uh here in nashville we all know that you know we have an affordable housing crisis um and we feel like you know you know we can make this happen and if we can create a, some type of 10-year plan um, to work across different agencies, departments, and sectors, um, you know, we can we can make this happen. And we feel, you know, that we should probably have a separate Metro Department of Affordable Housing uh, outside the mayor's office, uh, led by senior level policy and program experts. And also, um, you know, it's, it's definitely, you know, as no, you know, we we here to, to um, eradicate systemic uh, racism in this. In 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 all of this, racism plays a part. And so um, we, you know, we would like to see a, you know, a ramp up of housing investment um, in the, on a scale, to, you know, to address affordable housing crises. And more specifically, you know, we we would like um, 
we had like the mayor, you know, to you know the the donate in the physical year, like thirty million dollars back into the the Barnes Fund, more specifically, um, you know, thirty million uh, per year over three years into the Barnes Funds, you know, so nonprofit businesses can can do good planning uh, with that money, and uh, and lastly, um, again, you know, something that the pandemic is is really highlighted is you know uh, mental health diversion, mental health crises. Uh, in the city of Nashville, you know, um, you know, a lot of people will suffer by the not only the pandemic, but the March 3rd tornado. Um, and with the pandemic, you know, the mask mandates, you know, the first person that was arrested for not following the mask mandate was a black man who was homeless. They clearly had a mental health crisis. But, you know, we can't we can't jail or police um, our mental health crises. So um, I know there's been talks with a co-response uh, crisis intervention team model and that being funded. But. Um, here at NOAA, we would like the police not involved in mental health crises directly. Um, they should definitely be a partner and um, a second responder, but we would definitely like a, a more community-based uh, behavioral health crisis intervention program, you know, staffed by Nashville-based nonprofit communities and uh, mental health centers uh, that are already licensed for uh, a wide carrier of services. And so um, we would like all those things to be considered and, and to be funded for in the upcoming budget of fiscal year 2022. Thank you so much for uh, sharing that drama. It's, it's interesting that you uh, brought that up. I, I was just on a meeting right before this one, um, and there was a there that was a part of the conversation about the um, proposed, uh, the, the pilot program for the alternate response. Um, and it was very, very uh, insightful. Um, and I would, uh, one of the NOAA members was there. So if you want to reach out to Sean Witzel after the meeting, he could give you a really good update on what was uh, discussed. So some of what you have mentioned um, was already discussed. So I think uh, for the sake of time here, we won't delve into it, but I would recommend that you reach out to him. And I would say, I want to say this one time, we do have a, um, a proposal um, and a budget proposal of of a, of a national health emergent um, um, engagement and liaison service called HEAL. So that's a proposal in in an alternate proposal that we're trying to offer through NOAA and instead of the CIT co-response model. Just for the record. Thank you for sharing that with us. And our last uh, community partner, a uh, community voice that we have with us is Mr. Jama Muhammad. Uh, so uh, Jama, if you could also uh, share with us uh, what you believe um, uh, our budget priority should be for our upcoming year. After going after Jerome, I really wanted to just, everything that Jerome said, I want to absolutely uh, echo all of that. I think what he said was all the things that a lot of people in this city are thinking about, and that's what a lot of people are talking about. Um, we don't want to, see, we want to see more social emotional learning in schools. We want to see a focus on education in our, uh, in the city and we want to see affordable housing. Um, and just looking at like these hidden costs of homelessness, we really need to think about, uh, how we're criminalizing poverty in this city and how that drives inequity. Um, and I, I can't really say it enough. I want to echo all the things that he said uh, and um, just want to see more, a more of a focus on these type of things like affordable housing and just this ending of uh, the criminalization of poverty. Um, can't just lock up all of our homeless people and things of that nature. Um, so, yeah. All right. Thank you so very much, uh, Mr. Muhammad. We appreciate that. And now we're going into uh, round two and we are coming uh, very close on time, everyone. Um, so if we could try to limit these responses to um, about two minutes, we're, we're obviously going to go over a little bit past uh, seven o'clock. So if you could please uh, keep your questions brief as well as your responses, we will rotate to allow each community panelist to ask one question at a time. Um, and then uh, we'll have who that person uh, is directing that question to. So uh, first up, Miss um, um, Gilmore, you mentioned uh, a question about sidewalks. Did you want to uh, did you want to pose that uh, into a question? 
Um, yes. So um, my question is to anyone um, who's able to provide a response. But if anyone, um, if if they're aware of any information, if you could just update me of of how the progress of completing sidewalks in Nashville is going um, based on um, the vice mayor's uh, special committee and the report that was submitted um, actually a year ago this month, February 2020. Thank you. Thank you. And that question uh, will probably be best answered by Kristen Wilson from the mayor's office. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to, to help out with that. Um, one of the maybe more important things we've been doing over the course of this year is actually getting a much better understanding of our uh, sidewalk costs and execution uh, program and, and really uh, putting in place a few different things already to help us uh, build more sidewalks more quickly in Metro Nashville. Um, that includes looking at a much more performance management based approach to how we procure and manage our vendors, make sure that they are uh, giving us the best value um, for uh, the dollars we allocate for sidewalks. Um, we're working through building a design toolkit around different types of sidewalks. So instead of having one standard way that we do it, which can require a lot of workaround and, and, and effort, um, uh, having a little bit better of a portfolio of different types of sidewalks for different situations to uh, to, to modify and, and again, speed our execution manager costs better. Uh, we have a construction manual um, that we've been working through with Public Works over the course of the past year. Uh, this is the best practice around, around many cities, um, which really uh, helps put the parameters in place for how the development community and how utilities will interact with our with our sidewalks, our, our requirements around them. Um, and, uh, and I'll, you know, there's been a very robust discussion around that in recent weeks over the transportation plan that council has authorized that was proposed by, uh, by Mayor Cooper. And uh, that placed a pretty significant priority on sidewalks, as well as, as I mentioned, as we go into this operating budget, we're, we're putting some emphasis on creating a department of transportation to focus more on execution. Now, over the course of the last year, because of some of our financial challenges that we've already um, been discussing, we put a non-essential capital a spending freeze in place that has limited some of our building while we've been working on all of these improvements. Um, and uh, as we're moving further into fiscal stability and we're hopefully going to be able to continue to move forward, we have about $40 million of spending authorizations for sidewalks in our backlog that we're looking forward to move, moving forward. And this up coming capital spending plan right now that's in front of council has another 11 million in it um, for, for new sidewalks as well as money for repairs. So there's a there's a, a lot of opportunity in front of us and we're really working to position Metro to be ready to execute against that um, and to make the most of the dollars that we have. Stop there. Thank you so much for that response. So our next question, our next question is from uh, Mr. Jerome Moore. And I believe, uh, Jerome, you had a question for Councilman O'Connell about transit. You yes, thank you. Yep, thank you. Um, how are you doing, um, Councilmember O'Connell? Uh, it, was, it was refreshing to hear you bring up transit. Um, and I would I would just like to get your perspective on um, where, where do you see transit going and the possibility of it really happening here in Nashville like we need it to happen with the influx of just new people and just be able to easily navigate, especially in times like when we have our many, you know, snow blizzards here uh, in Nashville. Yeah, thanks, Jerem. This is a tough one. This is honestly what brought me to Metro Council in the first place. I first ran for office in 2015 um, as I was finishing up uh, several years of service on the Nashville MTA Board of Directors, where, you know, that was a very eye-opening experience. We spent a full decade uh, establishing a new normal for transit service in Nashville that uh, left us with a zero emission circulator service, including free service down Jefferson Street, um, that saw our ridership growth uh, outpace population growth year over year. And it was a decade of steady uh, incremental investment to move from a, an extraordinarily minimal operating subsidy to something that allowed us to start to see what frequent transit might look like on some of our most critical routes. In fact, we got uh, headway, <clears throat> excuse me, headways on the West End Corridor down to 
five to 10 minutes at peak. And, and you see, I mean, transit is one of those things as a public good that if you build it, people come, right? Uh, when you invest in routes that people are using, you see ridership increases. Every single time we added new service levels or frequency uh, in any kind of noticeable way, when we added the what is known as the BRT light service on the Gallatin corridor, uh, when we increased those frequencies on West End, uh, Nolansville, Murfreesboro, you name it, every time we saw service levels increase, we saw ridership correspondingly increase. Now, again, population was growing, but ridership is growing faster. Unfortunately, uh, as I took office, we paused that decade-long investment, and we've actually since been taking backward steps. One of the things that concerns me most as we come into fiscal year 22 is how we're going to operate the, the transit service that we have right now. Obviously, COVID-19 uh, saw transit levels plummet, not just in Nashville, but across the country. Now that there is good public health guidance for transit systems, it's going to we're going to start to see ridership steadily increase, just like we see uh, almost everything else returning to normal, uh, probably sometime later this year, right? We're going to see more schools open. We're going to see more people on transit. We're going to see more people returning to workplaces. Um, <clears throat> you know, vaccines are coming out. Transit, like so much of the economy, is linked to where our public health is. But, um, you know, a few years ago when I was first elected too, we had an opportunity to, uh, National MTA laid out very clearly what they saw in their in motion strategic plan, which is still the strategic plan for the authority, and laid out a system of tiers that would allow us to establish a frequent transit network that would be very usable, would be community-based, would see a network of community transit centers uh, would start to disrupt what we have as a very old fashioned hub and spoke system where, you know, buses kind of radiate out from downtown and come back in instead of having more cross town routes. Um, we would start to move toward those scenarios where you didn't have to come downtown transfer and go out to another part of the city. Um, I'm very pleased that Mayor Cooper <clears throat> has created a comprehensive transportation plan. Um, but my hope would have been that it, with $120 million in this capital spending plan under that transportation heading, we would have seen more than some local match dollars and shelters for transit, right? So it's going to be challenging. You know, I understand maybe taking a pause while we're still waiting for the economy to stabilize. But my hope is that by next year, uh, we see more on the capital side. We're going to have a big hole to fill in the operating side, though, because as FY21 got underway, there were CARES Act dollars available as one-time dollars that we used to dramatically reduce the operating subsidy for MTA structurally in our budget. We're going to have to replace those dollars, and then if we want the system to grow, um, add to those dollars. We've had one big public conversation about um, a dedicated funding source for transit. My hope is that we revisit that conversation uh, at some point under the auspices of the transportation plan that is now on the table from the Cooper administration, but it's going to be a big, important conversation if we go down that uh, road, so to speak. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jerome, for your question. The next question is from uh, Steve Kashopo. Um, and Mr. Kashopo, you had several questions, and I think that uh, for the sake of time, the one about the property tax assessment, about reforming and improving the property tax yep. assessment is, is timely in a reassessment year. So you want to ask that question? I, yeah, I do. Thank you for doing that, because I was going to suggest that. My first questions, an email response would be fine from those people you have identified to, to answer. But you're right. The second question uh, is important to me because I think it's one of the biggest uh, hurdles you all face at Metro um, with the, the way the property taxes are, are, are handled here, the way the revenue comes in, the revenue neutral language and the reassessments every four years. Um, I, I don't see it being workable, obviously. Um, I come from a state where property taxes were reassessed at transfer. So every time they were sold, new fair market value was, was appraised and the tax base was based on that new taxable value of the property. And in those states, property transfers all the time, buying and selling. And look at Nashville here, all the people who are selling their homes, moving here, moving to greater homes, bigger homes, whatever. 
um, but you don't get the increased revenue necessarily. But the system I'm used to is reassess the transfer and they're reassessed every year uh, with a cap of 2% growth so that the long-term homeowner has been there for 30 years, but their property is valued exponentially on a fixed income. They can't afford that. So they, they are kind of locked in at a homeowner rate. So my question to you is, what can be done here to change that? And as I look at it, you have your state law, but with Metro being a charter uh, government, it would seem to me that that could possibly go to a, uh, a vote to allow yourselves to have a more fair and predictable uh, property tax assessment here. Uh, thank you. And Director Crumbo, would you like to address that question? Yeah, sure. So uh, nice to meet you here uh, via Zoom. And um, I, I would think about your question this way. Um, on the one hand, uh, there is the academics of that, as you mentioned, state law and so many other things to think about in order to bring around the change. And um, there's a lot of people that would need to weigh into this and tell you, you know, like you, what their experience has been elsewhere. Um, what do they see here that is within our reach that we could change to accomplish, you know, some of those objectives over time. Uh, but quite frankly, um, right now I need to work with the system that we have and just look at the practicality of, you know, where we are here in this pandemic economy that um, uh, Councilman O'Connell referred to earlier. Um, where will we be in terms of the predictability of our revenues here uh, just in the next uh, couple of years? And uh, that is high on my mind because, you know, we as a metro government have reached a place of stability. And uh, there's uh, no louder voice on that right now from, a, uh, again, an academic financial standpoint, as well as a market standpoint, that uh, the bond rating agencies that look at Nashville's financials, uh, you know, up one side and down the other and eventually say, um, what, what is your position is what's your outlook? Uh, they have all moved us uh, to stable. Uh, they have uh, put us at investment grade, and uh, we have been very successful in refinancing a lot of debt uh, of the city and saving the taxpayer a lot of money relative to what's expected going forward. And so as I think about those ratings and what was said in the narratives of those, I was very clear in there that the expectation is that we will continue to grow our revenues, um, including that property tax, and really work with the system we have. And so I think as we come into this uh, assessment year, I'm going to get to know this um, a lot better than I do today. Uh, we're going to see you know, what challenges this pandemic economy brings to us. And then I think uh, if we don't have a very positive result, then we'll probably back up and start looking sooner at some of the issues you raise here. Uh, but again, just as a matter of practicality, we've got to work with the system uh, that we have. And Madam Chair, do you mind if I jump in there and follow up Mr. Crumbo's remarks? Sure. sure. Thank you. And um, Steve, this is a great and important question because it, it colors so much of how we do local governance in the state of Tennessee. It's more than just the system that we have. Um, it, it's not a system we have any kind of unilateral authority to change. The state is the arbiter of how we are authorized to collect revenue. But basically, they give us two fairly large sized levers uh, through property taxes and sales taxes. And then there are some marginal levers around the edges, but we have almost no room for maneuver under state authority. Even our property tax freeze and relief programs that are administered by the trustee's office as, as a potential antidote to gentrification, we can't even set the income or age thresholds there on a local basis. Those are all state controlled initiatives and it is very challenging uh, to operate a local government when you have such little freedom of, of movement in terms of how you're going to structure your revenue. We can't levy impact fees to make sure that infrastructure uh, keeps up with development. Uh, there are so many things that other cities and counties around the country do that Nashville simply cannot do because of legislative authority. Right. And I'll just add to yours, <laughs> Councilman O'Connell. Um, you're right about those constraints, uh, but a lever that we do have, and really speaks to the question here too, um, academically, these things are important, and how do we move them to a practical standpoint once we're past some of the realities that we have in this economy is to recognize that the economy that we have here in Middle Tennessee and Nashville is the largest in the state. Uh, 
and it gives us a very big voice in trying to move some of our uh, state legislature, the governor, and so forth to work with us if we see that the system we have here, you know, isn't going to serve us well uh, into the future. So um, it's a it's a great question, one that um, I hope to uh, address at some point, but I can't say loud enough, I really need to work with the system that, that we have here uh, today. Thank you, but just so I can make sure I understand. So it can't be anything done through local initiative to the voters through your charter. It would have to be through uh, the state legislature, correct? To change any of the things that you mentioned in your question, yes. Okay, thank you. Right. Thank you so very much, uh, Director Crumbo, and thank you, uh, Councilman O'Connell. Those were some some great answers, and uh, my my not even two cents. My one cent will be uh, my recommendation will be to reach out to your state representative to let them know uh, your concerns and to um, engage in that conversation since that is state level language. So we appreciate you so much. Uh, the next question will go to uh, Jason Freeman. Um, Jason, you had a, a question about uh, taxing corporations. If you could pose that question, we would appreciate it. Yeah, and um, and since since they since we did just cover that state law governs uh, revenue, it might sort of be answered. Uh, but that you know, a lot of people ask instead of property taxes or sales taxes, why we can't tax Amazon uh, or big companies like that. Um, and if that answer is short, I was also I was just going to see. We hear that there have never been there haven't been a lot of cuts made in metro government. I was wondering if someone could comment on how long we've been in different hiring freezes and cuts that have been made over the years. Sorry for sneaking two in there. Sure. So um, a suggestion here, why don't I address the uh, income question, uh, the tax question, and then uh, Kristen, if you want to address the uh, operations question on cuts, or if you want me to keep going, I'll be, be glad to do that. Um, but with respect to uh, you know taxing Amazon or the income tax and so forth, uh, you're right. We did talk about that earlier, and the primary sources of revenue for us are property taxes and um, activities taxes and so forth. And uh, one of the things that is really important to um, our activities taxes, uh, it, I mean, it is Amazon and companies like it where uh, we have within our reach today uh, the ability to uh, collect taxes on things that are transacted there that uh, even a few years ago uh, we weren't able to do um, either at law or because of technology limitations. And so my own belief is, is that when we're on the other side of the uh, pandemic economy and we're able to look deeply at the analytics of what's happened, we're going to find out that one of the things that kept um, our revenues a little higher than uh, so many of us were forecasting was our ability to capture the taxes on those transactions. And so I tell you that um, to say that when we think about Amazon in particular, as large as it is and how we all transact there, uh, let's don't confuse the goodness of all of that with what I think is an underlying issue to say we have large corporations and others that are moving here. Uh, we expect them to be good, responsible citizens and pay their fair share, as the saying goes. And, uh, you know, I think that the property tax laws we have apply to them just like they do to the rest of us here. And, and we'll certainly uh, make sure that those things are collected. But I uh, don't want to confuse the transactional taxes and the goodness that that brings uh, to us. And it's not that Amazon is paying those taxes but rather provides us the opportunity to capture those activity taxes that we would, you know, for example, if you went to your local convenience store uh, as an alternative. So I'll stop there. And Kristen, if you'd like to address the spending reductions, um, feel free. If you want me to keep going, I'll do that. I can jump in. Thanks. Um, uh, Jason, I'm going to apologize. Uh, both Kevin and I have a limited history with Metro government. Um, we both started in October of last year. And so I can't go back over a decade uh, off, the, off of my experience from, from your question. But I will say we knew as we came in that there's been several years of um, management practices uh, around the budget um, uh, that were qualified in different ways. Um, and, and, and I'll say from my prior municipal experience, that's not unusual. It's not unusual at the end of the day to um, continue when you set your budget to look for ways to um, make sure over the course of the year that there is a, an effort to maximize the, the value as much as possible um, as you go through that year. Um, uh, and so I, I know as we came in in FY20, there was both those kinds of activities underway as well as some financial challenges uh, already underway um, 
in October, November, December, uh, 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 Metro government was in a situation in which it had um, to respond to a state concern about our financial situation. And we had uh, about a $40 million gap we uh, had to solve by December. And in order to maintain, as, as, uh, as Kevin shared earlier, a, a balanced budget, which is a requirement on us. Um, most of those we saw through revenue uh, options, not all of it. Um, there were cost uh, savings that we had to make at that point in time, uh, in that short period of time in order to, to, to move forward. Um, as we moved then into March and as we started to um, get into a much more challenged situation with COVID, we rolled out a hiring freeze. Um, we rolled out uh, the non-essential capital spending freeze in that spring. It was to mitigate our revenue losses to the best of our ability to ensure that we would be able to respond to the challenges that were in front of us. Um, and uh, through those, we re reduced spending probably about an, another 30 million or so from general government just to conserve cash. Um, we needed it, every dollar of those. Um, uh, you know, in my mind, uh, uh, government governments are just critically needed in, in emergencies. Um, uh, each and every one we've been through, uh, we've been necessary to, for us to reprioritize our dollars as much as we could to just protect life, health, safety. And so that was the function and the position that we found ourselves in as we we're going into that budget. Um, uh, and so uh, that spending freeze, we were able to lift for a brief period of time uh, over the course of the summer. But as we continued through the year and, and have had some challenges, it's been back in place. And so uh, our, our hope is we don't need to utilize that um, as we move into more stable position. Um, that is, that is uh, in my mind, a, a little bit of a compromise of the um, funds we were authorized by council to utilize. Um, and, and again, it's the, it's the reprior, reprioritization that we had to do um, for this year. Uh, and as we move out of, into a much more stable situation, we're hopeful we can, we can move forward without having to have a higher increase in the future. Um, uh, and uh, that's a that's TBD as, as we see uh, what Kevin's revenue forecasts look like. And uh, as we work through the budget process with elected officials who make those decisions for us. Hope that helps. Uh, thank you so much. I do have uh, Councilmember O'Connell. We see your hand. Um, I will call on you uh, just as soon as we do this follow up. Um, one follow up uh, since a part of uh, Mr. Freeman's question was around the hiring freeze. So a question for Chief Swan: um, Has the fire department been on a a, a firing? Uh, excuse me, a hiring. Hope you haven't been on a firing, but have you all been on a <laughs> hiring freeze? And if so, how has that impacted your department? All right. Uh, thank you, Ms. Porterfield. Uh, so the, the question was, was have we been on a hiring freeze or and how have that affected our department? Well, I think two parts here. Uh, when, when we talk about the growth of the city, we've all been saying this from, I think everybody's talked about the city's not just growing up, but it's growing out. And, and, and yes, uh, one thing that I was really impressed with, at least with this uh, the administration coming in, understanding the shortfalls of uh, the uh, public safety. And I know that the, the mayor has actually ran on this uh, as far as uh, the interest from his uh, from his party. So uh, public safety uh, and shortage of personnel and staffing is always a key issue. And I think when we look at um, uh, Mark Young uh, had stated about how we're short and, and comparable to other cities and also it's going back a few years. These are no secrets. Uh, we've been saying this for quite a while and, and even the, the current administration, Kristen and Kevin uh, Crumbo and, and uh, the mayor, all of those, all of them know that and, and have a great understanding of that. And uh, I think I feel comfortable with at least they understanding the things that it's going to take for us to get to where we're at. But, but, and I just wanted to throw that in there because I just think that's worth mentioning as far as uh, where we're at as a department, uh, attrition and, and, and uh, shortfall. But your question directly to me was as far as a hiring freeze. So, uh, and I want to make sure that I'm clear on how I answer this because we are still able to hire 
share and and even uh, even promote make promotions only because we're backfilling. And it's like it's not like we're new hiring anybody to create a position or even when we make promotions. It's not that we're promoting it into a new role. All we're doing is backfilling. That means we've got X amount of staff. It takes that amount of staff members for us to be able to function correctly and properly in the city. We're already sort of short. So when we, if Will Swan retires, then basically uh, we are allowed to hire back for Will Swan because we cannot function without having certain numbers. So it keeps our number, our current numbers where it's at. So everybody is affected by the hiring freeze, but we do more of what we call backfilling. Same if Captain Swan um, retires, I have to put another captain in that position because that's a leadership role. So that's what we're able to do. So um, I think when they talk about hiring freezes, it, it affects every department and, and especially now for a new position or for our administration, and that's when you would definitely, we will not even be able to do that. It's just for our frontline personnel uh, in, enable to a, enable us to continue to do what we should be doing. We're able to just replace the backfield employees that have retired. Uh, thank you so very much, Chief. And uh, Councilman O'Connell, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, I think this kind of combined, I think Jason's comments, uh, Steve had submitted a question that are kind of linked here. And I guess it's important to note a few things. Um, you know, we, we had basically, for anybody elected as far back as 2015, we effectively had, you know, one and a half years of normalcy before um, things started to get to, uh, you know, I, I hear, I know Director Carmo has focused on stability here. Um, we destabilized our local government. Uh, when you have a mayoral administration uh, collapse midterm it, in a strong executive city, it simply makes things harder to govern. Um, to Jason's point, we stepped off the ordinary cycle of uh, kind of countering the process of state required equalization uh, by even keeping up with cost of goods and services, inflation, et cetera, which we have historically taken as a city the year of an assessment cycle. We stopped doing that last term and it took us most of the rest of the term to rebuild. Um, and some of that happened through one-time asset sales, but it is not as if Metro has not been cutting. We had a blue ribbon commission that looked at the budget and found targeted savings for repeated years. We abandoned the three-year pay plan for Metro employees. That is a cut. Hiring freezes effectively cut government service by failing to allow them to grow with the rate of population growth. Um, we have we have done everything uh, but come back to taxpayers until last year when we were under the threat of a corrective action plan from the state comptroller's office, and that occurred both at our local water utility. Uh, as well as our local government. So I think to Director Crumbo's point, there has been an incredible amount of work done, not, not discounting the fact that that work was done against the backdrop of an, an, a global pandemic with serious local consequences that you know really included almost no federal support. We can't run a deficit. It is not correct to say that Metro government has run a deficit. What we do is we cut. We have had to impound funds, uh, we have had to go into hiring freezes, and sometimes that means when somebody leaves a position, that position can't even be filled. It's not that you're stopping the growth, it's that you are stopping filling holes that emerge as you are trying to govern on the fly. We have lost four transportation planners at the Metro Planning Department, and we cannot fill those positions at a time when we need to be planning our transit and transportation future. This is a very, very difficult scenario to govern through, and I think it's important to recognize that. So I'm, I'm eager to see us uh, start to stabilize. I'm definitely uh, disappointed that it has, uh, you know, in a pandemic cycle, uh, felt like we're fully rolling back what was effectively a large property tax cut uh, back in 2018. Okay. Is that going forward, where we do get to that predictable revenue site, what used to happen for years in Metro was that you would do that property assessment, you'd get your tax rate, and for four years you had predictable budgeting. My hope is we're about to return to that point, and it can't come soon enough. 
Uh, thank you so much, uh, Councilman O'Connor. I think that was very, very helpful. Um, I think, you know, sometimes the narrative has gone out that Metro has not made cuts. Um, so it's very helpful for the viewing audience to hear um, what has happened over the last years and the ways that Metro uh, effectively has been making cuts over the last uh, year. So thank you. And uh, I will uh, give the last question to Mr. Young uh, with the firefighters. And uh, after that, I'll kick it back over to Council Member Toombs uh, to close us out. So, uh, Mr. Young, uh, we are recognizing you to go ahead and, and uh, close us out. Thank you, Council Lady. Uh, my question is, uh, I'm going to pull it up. Uh, the uh, prior to uh, FY21, uh, Vice Mayor Shulman uh, put a committee together and it was made up of uh, several council members, uh, private uh, or, or citizens and uh, union leaders. And, he, and the, the task was to do a pay study. And we completed the pay study and we actually submitted it to uh, uh, the council and the mayor's office <clears throat> for consideration. And of course, COVID hit and a lot of stuff hit. And I think we all understand that. But going forward, we've got the tax, uh, the tax rate that uh, we, uh, we think we need. Going forward, will this pay study uh, be considered? And also uh, something that was very uh, disappointing, uh, especially within my ranks, was the freeze of the uh, uh, step increase. Will the step increase be funded in the upcoming budget? So two part question, pay study and step increase. Thank you, Council Lady. Uh, thank you so very much. And that can be directed to uh, maybe a, a combination of um, of um, uh, Director Crumbo and uh, Chief Swan. And uh, Kristen, you may wanna hop in on that as well. So um, we're, we're over time, but we do wanna give you all the opportunity to answer that. Kristen, do you want to go first? I can go first. Um, um, Mark, uh, we we uh, have worked very closely with HR on a compensation philosophy uh, here at Metro Government that looks at market-based data each year, looks at um, the midpoint of that market-based data, looks at where we are uh, uh, on our pay, against other cities. And, and I know a lot of these um, cities, HR has worked very hard to gather input from unions, um, even on which cities are compared or what we consider and look at as part of that, that overall basket. But that is our, our compensation philosophy that we apply and we apply it as fairly as we possibly can across um, all aspects of the government. And then that results in a pay plan that is brought to the Civil Service Commission. I know you know this very well. Um, the study itself, I know, has been referred into the HR uh, department and that they are incorporating that into the pay plan formulation, not uh, in terms of taking those cities, taking that data and bringing that into the same process that they do uh, across the larger basket of cities that they look at each time. And if it turns out that the data indicates that um, we are off somewhere, we will make those adjustments. We made even last year adjustments um, for this compensation philosophy across uh, the entire an entire metro government. We're services based business. It's really important for us to take care of our employees and to and and to do the best we can um, with with the resources we have to provide for them. So that will continue to be the case. That will um, if if those data points work out in the process of the HR evaluation then those, you will see that on the other side of the pay plan that's presented to the Civil Service Commission. And I know there's a lot of discussion that occurs and that you participate in that. On the step increase side, um, I, I know that uh, if particularly in a lot of uh, uh, public safety roles uh, in schools, uh, there's a structure uh, and, uh, that, that really looks at the way you feel like you're, you're moving up in your experience is that you move a step. Um, that you've demonstrated your work over the course of the year and you're rewarded by that. Um, it's not just the pay. Uh, the pay is a very important part, but it's also an important kind of acknowledgement of the experience that you've developed over the course of the year. And that is, we understand that. And that is that is really important and critical. Um, last year, uh, as you know, we passed uh, 
through the Civil Service Commission a plan to fund the steps. And then as we watched over the course of a few months, the, uh, or actually should say a few weeks rather in days, the deterioration of our revenues around us, we had to go back and, and make a different determination. And that was, that was hard for us. That was very difficult for us. That was probably the hardest decision we had to make in the budget process, to be honest, um, among a lot of hard decisions, or at least knowing that we were um, turning to our public safety individuals and saying, like everyone else, unfortunately, right now, we don't have the resources and, and we know we're going to go into year where we have to ask a lot of you. And so I don't, I don't know where this year will go yet. Again, it's early. We're, we still need to see what the pay plan is. That still needs to go through uh, the civil service process. Um, we still need to uh, see what our resources are. We still need to look at all the priorities we have. But uh, I can assure you that we're going to give it as much diligence as, as we've intended to in the past. And if we're able to, to, to take care of our employees, that's going to remain a, a, a pretty important priority for us. I hope that helps. Kevin? Kristen, yes, thank you. Uh, sorry, Council Lady, I'm sorry. I just want to let Kristen know that I understand uh, what she's just mentioned, and we look forward to uh, this conversation further down the process. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Director Crumbo and Chief Swan, did you all have anything that you uh, needed to add to that? before we close out? Uh, there's nothing I can do to improve upon that. Um, it's a complex thing. It's gotten a lot of good attention, good thoughtful analysis, and hopefully the comments Kristen provided are comforting. And it's, uh, again, it's early in this budget process. We have a long way to go. And I know that uh, folks are anxious to what this next budget is gonna look like, but you know, we're still in the end of February. Um, you know, a lot of folks are here on the call or stepping away from other things that they're managing for Metro to be here, you know, to discuss tonight. So just be patient. The budget process will, you know, be here, be here soon. Yeah, and I would just um, echo basically, you know, the step increases and in comparable salaries, they are all of the HR, in the HR uh, wheelhouse, and uh, we will look for them to make the you know, the, the appropriate decisions. And, uh, and it sounds like Kristen's uh, answer was appropriate. Um, and of course, as a director, uh, like any director of any department, I'm gonna always advocate for, for the men and women that work for our department and, and hope that uh, they get worth their worth. And, and again, at the end of the day, uh, it's a process and I'll just uh, appreciate everybody's willingness to, to even give attention to it. So thank you. Thank you so much. And okay, Councilwoman Toons, you're up. Thank you so much to all of the panelists for, for joining us this evening and, and spending some time with us to, to educate the public on different perspectives on the budget and what our city's priorities should be. I mean, we could talk about the budget for hours and hours, and we have, this is session 10, uh, and we have have our final session next Thursday, six o'clock, uh, session 11, and we'll be talking about the, the, the more of the technical logistics of the budget process and participatory budgeting. So I hope that you all will join us next week for our final session. And again, thank you for tuning in. Have, have a good night, y'all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit Nashville.gov.